Welcome back to Mishpacha Magazine's Take Two. We are the names, the figures, the faces, the ideas familiar to you from the pages of the magazine come to life for deeper discussion. Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson certainly needs no introduction. There isn't anybody watching this show now who hasn't seen a clip, heard a Devat Taira, heard an idea, seen a Vart printed from Rabbi Jacobson over the last 10, 15 years and said, wow, wow, I need to hear more from this man. So it's a schus. A real schuss, and anybody who knows how difficult it was to actually get him to come into into studio today knows how overwhelming it is to actually be sitting across Robert Jacobson. Welcome, thank you for coming again. Thank you for the honor. It's uh, you're a busy man. Thank this, you this for was, the privilege. This is quite the feat getting you to come in, and we don't we don't take it for granted. Robert Jacobson, forgive me, forgive my blunt style for asking. What is it that you do? <laughs> now you sound like one of my children. <laughs> <laughs> Who for years have been asking me, Tati, what do you do for a living? <laughs> it is for a living. You created a role. Uh, l- let's go into Lubavitch, where things are a shlicha. So I'm a shlicha here, and there's a shlicha to different geographical locations. There's a shlicha to cyberspace. What, what is your shlicha? What is your role? What is th- that you do that you see yourself as great, your role? Great question. By Jews, I think we uh, respond to questions with stories. So when I was a young child, it was one Shabbos afternoon, and I was standing at a Shabbos afternoon fabreng and gathering of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory. There were maybe five or 6,000 men in the room, and he suddenly turned to me, and he asked me a question in Yiddish that I'll never forget. He pointed his finger at me, and he said, From wann and weist du, welt? How do you know that the universe exists? Nobody ever asked me such a question. How do I know the world exists? Besides, I wasn't listening to his talk. It was deep, intricate sikhs and maimarim and explanations and shiurim. I was doing some other things. I was a little kid. I didn't know what to say. How do I know the world exists? But now there's 6,000 eyes looking at me. The Reb is waiting for an answer. 15 seconds that seemed like eternity. And I wasn't answering. (laughs) All I was thinking is, you know, live and let live. Move on. Talk. I'm not disturbing you. Don't disturb me. But then with a big smile, I guess, he felt he had to answer for me. So he said to this child answers in Yiddish. He said, Entfeter, this boy, this young man answers. You know why I know the world exists? The beginning of the whole Torah is in the beginning Hashem created heaven and earth. And then he went on. So from a pedagogical point of view... It was a wise move because the next Shabbos I was listening <laughs> from beginning to end because I didn't want to be again caught. Was that a big story? Was it a big thing to be singled out? It was out very by the unusual, was very unusual. unusual in 40, 50 years. It was very, very rare. For the rabbit to point at a child. Anybody, at anybody. Yeah. He had his style. You know, He would talk, talk for many hours. So this was very rare. As I got older, I wondered, you know, what was this all about? Today I look back and I say, perhaps it was some form of a mission statement to be able to help people from all backgrounds, all persuasions, all over the world to be able to see themselves and the universe from the perspective of Bereshis Bar Elikim Asashamayim Vesaretz. That's really what I try to do, to try to help empower people to see themselves as ambassadors of infinity, as divine ambassadors of love, light, hope, authenticity and healing. Okay. It's, it's quite the mission statement, but on a very practical level, a person has to get from point A to point B, right? You can't uh, go tell your mother when you're 17, I'm going to be an ambassador of, right? Infinity. How does a person, <laughs> you went um, from, from you being a chayzer of the rabbi, I think, you were following, let's say, the traditional path for somebody who's serious about learning and serious about chasidus within Lubavitch, right? You were learning, you were writing, you were a chayzer of the rabbis, remember, and, and all of a sudden, I wouldn't say you landed on the scene slowly. I certainly was familiar with, with your father, Al Vashalma, with the Algemeiner, and with his work, his literary work. So, you know, and I was, I was familiar with your name as well. But one day it just became uh, like your, your message was everywhere. H- how did that happen? How did it evolve? What, was it a plan? Just take us through the last 20 years. Yeah, so I don't know you were that a I. Rav of a shul? Were you a mashbia in a yeshiva? Were you teaching in the classroom? How did you get from point A to where you are now? Right, so it, it's, it's a good question, and the truth is I sometimes <laughs> ask myself the question, even if that sounds a little uh, cliche or dramatic. I never planned on this. This was not the trajectory that I was strategizing about. Um, I never went to a life coach who said, choose this career, and this is how it's going to happen five years, 10 years, 15 years. 
When I was a bacha, yeshiva bacha, I had the privilege of being on the team of what they called chayzrim, oral scribes of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who were responsible to memorize and transcribe many hours of talks for publication over Shabbos and Yom Tov. Of course, there were no recording devices. So I did that, and I did that dutifully for many, many years. It's quite a daunting task. It was... How, it, how do you force yourself to memorize something? It, it's not a trick. You really have to... No, not a, tr- not a trick at all. And the Rebbe didn't speak for five minutes. The Rebbe could give sikhs that were an hour, two hours, and a Fabrengen could go from three to eight hours. And you would write it down, and the Rebbe would review it himself? So, sometimes he would review it. Most of them he didn't review. Well, wow. he just asked that he should write that it's not reviewed. It's called Bilti Muga. He was not. He did not edit it, so people understand. And did you ever get feedback people, from the rabbi? Yeah, a lot of feedback. Positive. <laughs> and mostly, it was uh, crit- c- feedback of a real crit- critic, meaning critic of the highest caliber, who demanded and saw the potential of writers to be able to try to deliver an impeccable product, at least as far as humans are concerned. Extremely nuanced, uh, extremely uh, focused on accuracy and authenticity and truth and structure and syntax and style. So you knew, and if grammar. you weren't doing a good job, you would have known about it. Someone, yeah, and, and, and if your reference to Toysavis was wrong, there had to be footnotes. You know, if, if the reference to the Rambam or Toysavis or, or even the Maram Shif or the Beer Hagro was wrong, it was very upsetting to their. So it must have been an impressive team. You must have had yourself and the people around. Well, you must the, have been the quite... chief Chayzer is a Jew today in his 90s, Rabbi Yoel Khan, sure. who was there from 1950. And every few years he would take in a few new Bachrim who he felt were skilled um, to get involved in this. I have an older brother, Rabbi Simon, who was involved in this, and he brought me in. So this was a team not of many people, five, six people. It was extremely daunting. I mean, you're talking about Fabrengans that could last between three and seven hours. There could be an hour sheer on a Gemara in Zvachim, and then there could be a Siyum on Tmura or a Hadron on Shas, and then an hour Rashi Sikha and Rambam, and then there's Kabbalah and Zoyer and Chsidus, then there's Jewish philosophy, Meir Nevuchim, Chkira, Machshava. Then there were contemporary issues. It was Israel and education and leadership and outreach. And, <laughs> and the flow was just... Uh, Endless, and the Rebbe wasn't a gesture, meaning it's not like half of the speeches were jokes. Can I ask you a question? I'm kind of curious, just yeah. as an aside. Did the Rebbe quote things that were not the traditional Chabad sources, other Chassidish Asfarim, or even not Chassidish Asfarim, often? And if yes, what were they? What would have been the prime? I don't mean Rambam and Rashi. I mean be later. Were there any yeah, yeah. Sfarim that the Rebbe drew on heavily outside of Chabad? Constantly. Like Constantly. What? what would you say I mean, the you Rebbe? see the Sikhs. Uh, in, among the, in the last generations, the biggest was Tzafnas Panayach, the Rebbe Chavar, who he considered one of his uh, teachers and masters. But I remember once, Achron Shal Pesach, he did a whole long conversation about a sugya that was in Chidush Reb Chaim Alevi Al Rambam. Do you ever quote the guy? Yeah. Often? Very often. Really? Yeah, the Bir Hagran Shulchan Aruch, but also all of his Svarim in Kabbalah. He had a tremendous yeah. piece in the Svarim of the Vilna Gaon in Kabbalah, which is you know, a rare commodity today. Right. And what about Zoya the rabbis who, so to speak, didn't get along with Alta Rebbe? Those rabbis who... Yeah, he would quote them. Easily. I mean, listen, the genre of his Maimarim were Chabad. Chabad. So, so the themes were from the Alta Rebbe. Did the Rebbe ever quote no. any of the rabbis? But huh? What about the rabbis in the Chabad dynasty who were not Lubavitch? The other rabbis? Like Kapos, Rebbe Strachella, yeah. Yeah, 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 I heard myself. But, really? Rebbe Strachella, yeah. Rabbi Was there anything that you'd say the rabbi didn't know? Listen, you remind me now of an amazing story. <laughs> Givaldi Kamaisa. This happened at a chasana. The Balatanya was present and there was a batchen. He was a chabat chasen. How do you do batchonas in front of your Rebbe and especially the Balatanya? Uh-huh. So he said a little lechayim. So it should be a little purim dik. So, you know, he would let loose. And everyone is looking. The Balatanya is sitting. And this batchen gets up and he says, Rebbe, after long contemplation, I decided there's no major difference between you and I. Everybody is shocked. He says, Herzog, I have to say it in Yiddish and then I'll translate. Yeah. What you don't know, I also don't know. Whatever I know, you also know. Elamai, so what's the difference? There's a few things that you know that I don't know. But now I want to ask you the gulf between what you know and what you don't know, isn't it infinite? <laughs> And the Alter Rebbe started to cry when he said that. So, you know, 
Rabbi Yosef Albo writes, Tachlis da'acha. The ultimate, ultimate knowledge is the knowledge that I don't know. In the Arizal, there's an expression, Reisha de lo yisyada. The head, the, the, on the top of everything, you reach the unknown. In Eitz Chaim of the Arizal, there's a portal called Shar Hasvekas, the portal of doubts. So I once heard from the Rebbe, he said, I asked my father, how can you have in the writings of the Arizal, Shar Hasvekas, the greatest Kabbalist in Jewish history, the portal of doubts, doubts, Sveikas? So he says, the Rebbe said, my father, who was a Makobar of Levi Yitzchak, he said, told me there are Sveikas that are inferior to knowledge and there are Sveikas that transcend knowledge. It's a different type of doubt. Uh, here, very elegant answer. Okay, so you're by the Rebbe and you're doing, you're being a chayzer by the Rebbe and you get married and you're still in that position. You're not well, the Rebbe th- passed away when I was 22. So I was still a yeshiva bach. I was learning, writing. Obviously, it was a very painful period for a person like myself and friends and colleagues. I continued learning in yeshiva for years. I continued learning. My father, Zechariah Levrachah, started to lose his best Yiddish writers. He had people like Dr. Hillel Zeidman, like Bensi Goldberg, like Nissen Gordon. These were classic, sure. real Yiddishisten who, who created Yiddish journalism. You know, since the 1930s, and they were they were dying, and in desperation, I guess he turns to me and he says, he called me Yosef Yitzchak. He says, "Could you write me a Yiddish column? I need the Sedra of the week." Dr. Zeidman passed away. Could you write? I'm like, "Ta, this is not my thing. This is not my fach." <laughs> but he asked of me, and I started to write this weekly column in the newspaper. And then somebody started to ask, ask me to give a sheer Tanya in Bar Park and. And a sheer Gemara here. Was there somebody who identified you and said, you, you could do this? No, I just, uh, was, and then one day I get a call from a rabbi in Highland Park, Chicago, a very fine man, and he said, I read your column in the Algemeiner, and I love how you write and what your message is. Could you come over and do a Shabbaton? I said, you got the wrong guy. I don't do Shabbatons. I don't travel. But you, says, you must have known that you could speak, that, you're, that you had this well, gift of being eloquent. I spoke in yeshiva, you know, I, chaburas, I gave over the sikhs and the maimarim and the shirim of the Rebbe, but it was in that format. Okay. It wasn't, you know, what you would call Mr. Lecturer or Speaker. So he says, I'll pay you a ticket. Come to Chicago, speak to my community. I said, I don't know what to say. He says, just say, say, say ideas and insights. So I went, he paid for the ticket. Whatever it was, and I spoke to the community. Stumble, then it was economy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for many years it remained economy. For many years, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. until I'll tell you how that changed, if you want to know. And I gave, and uh, I guess the oilum enjoyed, because the next week a rabbi from Great Neck phoned me and said, "Could you come for Shabbos?" So you know, things just started to develop. And uh, just one thing led to another thing, led to another thing. And, and what was your first formal posting, rabbinic posting? My first rabbinic posting was in a shul in Crown Heights called Beis Shmuel. Before that, I was a magachir in a yeshiva over there. One of the yeshivas over there, Beis Madrash, I would give a shir iyun and a shir pkiyas in Gemara for many years. And then this shul needed a part-time rabbi, Beis Shmuel, so they asked me and we began. You never considered going away on shlichas, going out on shlichas? Well, you were too busy in Karnats. I considered it a few different times, but the workload was pretty intense, and I was seeing Hatzlach in my own way, and I love teaching. Did you so always have, worked. forgive the question, and there's no, I mean, there's no premise to the question, if it sounds like it's an uneducated question, it's a lack of education on my end. Did you find that you had a unique ability for Lubavitcher Chassa to be able to talk to non-Lubavitcher Chassidim, to be able to walk into, a lot of times, people who belong to the Chassidim their whole life, uh, so to speak, they don't really understand the language of, of other places. You have this ability, today you certainly have it, that you could walk into virtually any community in Klai Israel and talk to them on their terms, in their nosach, in their lingo, based on their svarim. Was that something you always were able to do? It, it's a great question, not offensive at all. I actually appreciate the question very much. And the answer to that is I, uh, I always grew up with this uh, spirit, I would say, of really appreciating diversity and understanding that Klal Yisrael, and really the world is a rainbow. And Arucha uh, Meretz Midu Rechava Miniyam, the Torah is infinite. And there is a unique taste and flavor that you could find in each individual who is a unique reflection of the Rebbeinah Shalom, and certainly in each community and in each collective. 
I grew up in a home that was extremely um, sensitive to diversity. My father was a very colorful figure in his own way. He was a real journalist. He was a newsman. He loved press conferences and he loved journalism and loved politics and loved Down the to news. the to the uh, trappings of a journalist, the hats. Yes. The, the hat and the cigar. Right. And yeah. remember in those days, before the internet, before fax machines, before computers, it was typewriters. My father had typewriters everywhere in the house, and he had around 300 ribbons. People don't know what ribbons are today, but if your ribbon would finish in the typewriter, there was no ink anymore. So he uh, had ribbons everywhere. So if there would be a war for 10 years, he would be able to type. Even in the world of from journalism, he was, he was, a, he was a little bit of, he was a mechadish. That means he was <laughs> ideologically, right? Yeah, he was very unique because you have to understand the world of journalism. He was progressive. He, he, you meaning, could say Lubavitch so. Lubavitch was, so to speak, would be a right-wing chassidist politically, and he was left-leaning politically. Could, could we say that? I, well, in terms of, of Israel, Israel. And questions of Jewish identity and education, he was a very staunch... No, uh, I don't mean... I mean in terms of giving back land and peace and things like that. He was no, so, actually, more... he, so he was quite a right-winger, but the interesting thing about him, which you don't see, is that on the pages of his newspaper, he had a bunch of left-wing writers, and he would not censor them. Right. He allowed... Even though Lubavitch was from the yes, most extreme... In yes, because his newspaper... Did the rabbi appreciate that? I think the Rebbe had a very deep appreciation for this. Do you know if the Rebbe read Algamana? Oh, yeah, that I know. That I saw many times. I saw that uh, the Rebbe would sometimes come from his house with the Algamana, and he would often give feedback to he my would. father, yeah. C- criticism, compliments, but feedback. I saw many times also when he met him. It wasn't a Lubavitch a party paper, per se, the Algamana, but no. over the years when there was politics, he beca- yeah, it no. became a... F- he, my father himself was a Lubavitch a chassid. He was, a, I would say, a disciple of the Rebbe or at least a very strong admirer of the Rebbe, but the pages of the newspaper were filled with all types of views. I mean, there was, there was some very radical leftists who wrote there, and he would not censor them. So there was a very vibrant debate going on, and I also always admired, I could see him sitting with ideological opponents, and he would disagree with them, but never become disagreeable, uh, never uh, be offensive or, or denigrating or insulting. It was always like there was an inner confidence that I don't have to delegitimize you in order to disagree with you. And that impacted you. We, we, could, we could really remain friends, and that, that was a great lesson. Great you lesson must have had up. your own curiosity, because it's for you. It's not just that you, you don't get offended by other people. You have a real knowledge in the Hungarian Oberland, and, the, and the, I, I've seen you in Satma, Kleisenberger crowds. <laughs> I've seen you in Litvischer crowds. I've seen you in Orthodox crowds, and you're, 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 you have, seem to have an appreciation yeah, so for the, the Yerusha that each one of them have. Right, so I, I always had that inquisitiveness and that, that openness, and it's extremely, from my perspective, it's very enriching. It's enriching when one can see the full spectrum of Yiddishkeit in all of its colors and all of its depth. And Do you think that other people don't do that? I, I, not, not only Lubavitch, other Hasidim, are scared that their people, their children, will find out too much and like something better, so they don't expose them to it. Is that are we cheating our kids in, when we create a system, which is this is our way, so we're our messiah, so we're not exposing you to other foreign ways of thinking within Shulchan Aruch Yiddishkeit, obviously. Right, right. Well, I think it could come from two approaches. I think sometimes there can be an insecurity over there, but sometimes I don't know if it's an insecurity. It may just be that. You know, people are comfortable in a certain path, and this is their comfort zone, and this is what they know about. But I feel that, especially in today's generation, people are really thirsty and hungry to be able to have uh, unadulterated Yiddishkeit in all of its in all of its grandeur, in all of its majesty, in all of its depth. And when they see that, it's very refreshing for them. You think they didn't see it before today, before this generation? You think 15, 20 years ago they didn't see it the same way? I, we, think, we now there's much, the I think there's much more cross-pollination now. I think there is much more of people being exposed to other communities. There's so much more traveling, technology, of Did course. Did you find things from other communities that you didn't know that refreshed you? Constantly. Like what? Who's somebody or a safer or a person or a discipline or a thought that you said, wow? The Karlin tragedy just happened, Erev Shavuos. And I was inspired to open up a base iron. The next day I opened up a base iron. I, I learned base iron before. But, you know, it was <laughs> incredible Tyra. Stalin. Karlin. The, base, the second, there was Aaron Haggadl. The first of Aaron Haggadl was a student of the Magad. Right. But then there's the second of Aaron, base Sorry. iron. Right. Which really is the one, you know, the father of the one who put into a safer the chassidus of Karlin, of Stalin. 
I just an example, just of recent weeks that happened after uh, writing Anything from the non Hasidic world? Any Svarim approaches, writings, speeches that you said, wow, this impacted me, this is something? I never knew that. Constantly. I mean, throughout my youth, I tried to <laughs> get my hands on. Uh, my father had a lot of books in the house, a lot of Svarim of different genres, and not all were, you know, uh, uh-huh. Mamish, the holiest of the holiest, I would say. So I had a chance to uh, cruise to through lead. many different types of smart, many different types of groups in <laughs> Crown Heights, doing your thing, speaking your nosach, and also there's a demand for your message. How did you get from there to Manse? So I was there. I was a rov there for a few years, and then I really felt that Crown Heights is an amazing community, but it's one type of community. It used to be, you know, the center of all the communities, but then there was a mass migration. So Lubavitcher Hasidim remained, but most people left. And I felt that my, uh, my mission, or my shlichus, as you call it, would be more effective in a community that was filled with Jews of many diverse backgrounds, which would mean Chabad Hasidim, but many other Hasidim, and Yeshivish people, and Litvish people, and modern Orthodox people, and Jews of different stripes and different colors, and Muncie is such a type of community. So that, is, that was one of the... So somebody reasons. came in... No, nobody came, actually. No, you just decided Muncie? Nobody came. I did quite a few Shabbatons in Muncie. Uh-huh. In what's today known as Shiner's Shul or Chaim. I did some Shabbatons. I was here for different Yom Taivim. Just as I did many other communities. And I saw the energy. I saw the vibe. And you I had saw a the formal types of people. position in Muncie? You the Rav in China? So when I came, I, I had no formal position. I just thought I could continue doing what I'm doing before and just live here. I'm not very, you know, it's part of New York. Hey, so. hey, a person has to pay tuition about your health for Shabbos. We have to pay tuition. Gas in the car. This yes, stuff. by doing it. So I was still traveling, traveling and lecturing, and that was a source of income. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure, how, sure. how does that work? That, that means, I don't, I don't, what is the industry of being a, a firm lecturer? They used to be in the, in the Heim, to Magidim. When they finished, they passed around the hat, I think, <laughs> according to legend, and uh, people put in or didn't put in or yeah. took out even, how it, based on, I guess, uh, where it was and, and the level of Magidas, how inspired they were. What, what, how does that mean? It, it was, was there ever a concept in the firm world of paid lecturers before? And if a person's giving chizak, is there a price on chizuk? If somebody needs chizuk, you're going to say... It's a great question. It's really it's a great okay question. It's okay that I, Yeah, okay. Wonderful, yeah. In principle, we all know the Maimah Chazal, ma, ma ni bechina, ma fata bechina. You're not supposed to take a price for Torah. Right. Right. I didn't charge you for Torah. Don't charge anybody for Torah. Everybody knows the Rambam's opinion in Pirish HaMishnayis about rabbis taking salaries, about people getting money for learning or for teaching. We all know the Rambam's position. Subsequent poets can argue with their Rambam. However, that evolved in Klal Yisrael. It's a great question. Can somebody go give a shear? Forget about a speech. Am I allowed to go give a shear on any topic? Or a me shear? And get $100 for it? Get five. Well, it's, it's a great question. And it's a great halachic debate over the generations, which is certainly a fascinating discussion. But I think that principle has to be maintained. Even if you find a heter, you have to remember that in principle, you don't own the Torah. It's a heter. It's a hetter. Ma'ani bechina, af'ata bechina. There's a sefer called Derech Mitzvah Secha by the Tzamech Tzadik. He was a grandson of the Balatanya. He tells a story there of a Jew named Reb Mendel Barer. Reb Mendel Barer was what you call today a magid, a preacher, a pontificator. He was a student of the Baal Shem Tov. And he was known as a Kaddish Shalim, a Helek but he had a, a blessed mouth. And the Tzamech Tzadik writes, Reb Mendel Barer used to say that he only gives speeches in places where they pay him. So you would think, oh, you know, he wants the money, but he wasn't that type of person. So they asked him why. He said, Poshet, Ver binich zu sein azager zu andere yidin. Who am I? Where do I have the audacity to give Musr or rebuke or chastise or even give a message to another Jew who's a ben yachid of the Rebbeinah Shalayim? Vu kimich, where do I come to have the authority to tell you how to live or to inspire you or to give you Musr? He said, El I, if the people are giving me money, this means the Rebbein Yisholaylam wants that this should be my keli, my vessel for Parnassah. So then I have a heter to speak. Right, but then he says, Shalach to Shalach es ha'eim ves ha'bonem tikach loch. The aim is the mother, the cause, the antecedent. The children is the result. He says, maybe I came to this city because I'm going to have a Parnassah and I'm going to get money. But he says, don't get caught up in that. Shalach to Shalach es ha'eim. Remember that essentially it can't be about that. And I think in my life, what I always, you know, I, I, I tell myself, and I know that if I don't at least give, 
as many speeches that people don't know about for free to people who need a chizuk, to situations where it's really not about money. There's no big organization, there's no big sponsors, there's no big donors. Then something is off. In other words, if it ultimately becomes about making money, then ultimately I'm failing the people I'm speaking to and I'm failing myself. So money is a component, an important component, I would say. But you always have to, and I also have to have that perspective of you know, what it's ultimately about. So the, the, what it, you, and there's, there's a, quite a lot of invitations that I get you know, from people, individuals, situations, where there's really... No, I know. I, I've asked you personally over the years and, uh, to speak to people and to make time for people where there, where there was only Agnes Nefesh involved, and for sure you've been very accommodating. I know that. So the, the answer is that this is really that role, is what you're saying. Of tradition. It's traditional Magidas in the sense that I'm funded by that, but I give myself as much as I'm able to be the Rebbe Shalom's to that shlichus of inspiring Yidin and trying to sit with Yidin and listen to Yidin. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Somebody, I was sitting once at a meeting with, with serious people, educators, and they were saying that there's maybe a problem or an issue in the wider firm world where, where mediocrity rises to the top, so to speak. They said people learn how to work within the confines of a mindset or an establishment or an organization. They learn how to survive by not offending anybody and not being too creative and not being too original and not being too innovative. And this way they, they don't step on the wrong toes and everybody's comfortable and they go like this till they retire and they get a pen and pencil set and everyone says that's like a brilliant career. They said, um, and we're cheating people because no one becomes great unless they walk off this, I'm doing it my way. And the example they gave was quite a they, they said, <laughs> Rabbi Jacobson just went one day, he said, I'm doing this my way. He landed in Muncie, <laughs> and look, he's like a meteor shooting across the front world, inspiring people, doing it his way, and there's no precedent, and there's no organization behind you, and you're not associated with any vod of anything. You're just yourself, doing your thing on, on your website and, and on your terms, and, and like you say, the invitations are there, and somehow you've managed, I think, to cross the length and breadth of the firm world. What would you say about the, the premise of the question, which is that maybe we have an issue in letting people just do it their way and be as, as, as it pertains to yourself? Wow. So there's the Evan Ezra. The Evan Ezra asks why Moshe had to be raised in an Egyptian palace. Shouldn't the first Rebbe of Klal Yisrael know what a Shalom Zacher looks like? An Upshanish, a Pidin Aben, a Ba Mitzvah? Moshe Rabbeinu never saw herring. He never saw sponge cake. He never saw Vachnacht. Come on. The first Rebbe. That's the Evan Ezra's question. So of course he says, Soy da Shem Lirei, if God knows. But then he says, I'll tell you two reasons. Reason number one, if he would have grown up among Jews, they would have not respected him. Every Yachna would have said, I remember your bris, I remember your, I used to babysit. When did you become a Navi? Oh, when did you start hearing voices from God? That would be the end of Moshe Rabbeinu. The second reason, Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Where? Rabbeinu Ramadan, Parsha Okay. And this is 1100s, this is not 2021. This is 12th century Spain. <laughs> Rabbeinu Ramadan, one of the great Rishonim and poets and and the greatest commentators and philosophers in Jewish history. But then he says, I want to say a second reason. He says, if Moshe Rabbeinu would have grown up among slaves, he would have developed a slave mentality. And he could never stand up and revolutionize the landscape of planet Earth. He could never stand up to the superpower and make a mapecha, make a revolution. He grew up in an ambience of malchus, of royalty, of aristocracy. Such a person can change the world. I think that sometimes we feel, many of us feel, that if we keep the people down, we as a community will be more successful. And we don't let people flex their spiritual, psychological, physical, and emotional muscles to be able to become their best and deepest selves and change the world. So we're not perfect in that respect. (laughs) And a few other things. And... Sometimes there's a real concern. We're afraid, you know, what are people going to do with that freedom, with that expansiveness? You know, are they going to go beyond the pale? Are they going to go outside of Tchum Shabbos? In Russia, there was a Tchum HaMoyshev. There was a pale of settlement. I don't want you to go, to go out of that pale. And we understand that because Messira for us is divinely precious. Right? Rebbe says in Gemara, somebody who says something, not be pi rabbi, goyim l'shchim shetestalak mi Yisrael, the shchina leaves. We live thousands of years with a Rebbe and a Talmud, a Rebbe and a Talmud, that are so precious. And yet, you look at Rabbi Eliezer, he's constantly saying things, not in the name 
of his Rebbe. But he said, Lo Yomarti, Dover Shaloi Shamatim Pirabi, in Brachis and in Sukkim, many places in Shas. Yeah. And the answer, of course, is that Rebbe Eliezer heard in his Rebbe's words messages that other people didn't hear. He understood that the ultimate calling of Yiddishkeit is to be fully anchored in Shulchan Aruch, fully anchored in Dvar Hashem. Not to be Mavata okay, and a Kutzer Shul Yud. But you're being Lamas Chos really on the way we are. It's not so bad. That means we're a nation that doesn't change. That's a big part of our DNA is that we hold on and Messiah is real. It's not... Uh, so at the same time, it comes from a healthy place or a place that needs to be. We can't... We need to keep things tight. But at the same time, there's a cost. Is there an answer? Is, I guess what I'm asking then. There's, there's a big cost. The Sfasema says, Schor Yemois Olam, Binu Shnois Dor Vador. Says the Sfasema, Medafashtein, the shinuyim, the changes of every generation. A message that worked in one generation may be completely irrelevant Messiah. and ineffective. Svasemis knew about Messiah. But what the Svasemis was saying, the Badichava writes, it says in Toysvis Yom Tov in 80 years, that Teku is Tishbi Yetaritz Kushiz Vibayas. Elio Anovi is going to answer the question. So the Badichava has, the Helika Badichava says, I don't understand. The Gemara says in Yuma, People just learned in Dafyo Midaf, hey, Moshe of Aaron Imam. Moshe's gonna be there. If you have a question in a Toysvis, do you go to Elio Anavi or do you go to Moshe Rabbeinu? Yeah, good. This what they Tish be a tarot? Ask Moshe Rabbeinu. Eken Why are you going to Elio Anavi? Elio Anavi's a great man. He's a Malach. Moshe is the Rebbe of Klai Yisrael. Moshe Kibbal Tari Messina. You know the Badit Rans? <laughs> Atla of a fella. It's a Gdusha Slavi, Lakutim. He says, Moshe has been 3,000 years in Ghanaian. Elio Anavi has been around. He's at every bris. Good. He's at every seder. seder. He understands Good. the struggle of Good. a generation. You gave me the sources. <laughs> What's, okay, let me change the question a little bit. And think okay. you. There's people in Klai Yisrael who work out of the establishment. And some of them have gone beyond the pale and taking pot shots at the institutions, the schools, particularly people like yourself. I know a lot of your time is given to listening to the pain of either children who have been rejected by the system or their parents or adults who ask children. Uh, that's a big part of, of your message. It comes from the vetug, from the pain that you've heard and, and your desire to make change. You sit with a lot of victims of, of various kinds of abuse and you felt their pain. At the same time, you're very much associated with the, the glory of the way we're doing things that it's working. Either the system's working or it's not working. That's my first question. Is it working or is it not working? And basis, where do you see yourself? Are you, which side are you? Are you, are you in opposition or are you in the coalition right now governing? Where are you? Are you with the team? Are you with Am the, I with Bennett or Netanyahu? Right. <laughs> that means, where, where are you? Okay. I want to tell you a little title I once heard from the Rebbe, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I just figured out your trick. Me. You just keep wearing people with the tires and then they figure Listen out. to the tire and you'll tell me if it's an adequate answer to your question and if I could have given a better answer. You'll, draw, you'll be the judge of Israel. Maybe you interviewed many people. The Gemara says in Menachis Chavtesam at Beis, Moshe asked the Rebbe to see a shear for Rabbi Akiva. He showed it to him. Moshe sat in the 18th row. He didn't understand Rabbi Akiva's shir. He felt horrible. Finally, Rabbi Akiva was in the middle of a yisoid, and the student in the front row said, Rabbi, what's the proof? He said, This comes from Moshe. Moshe, calm down. Asked the Rebbe, and many mefarsh, something is stranger. Moshe is the greatest humble man. Moshe Anav Moed Mikalad. It says he always felt that if somebody else would have had his koiches, they would have done better. Finally, here's your test. Rabbi Akiva is giving a shir, and you know what? You don't understand what he's saying. He has reached greater heights. You should celebrate. Say, wow, amazing. Chol Shaddai Why Chol Shaddai What's the Chol Shaddai And then he's quoted. Baruch Hashem. Thank God. Come on. This is Moshe Rabbeinu. You quoted me. I'm good. I don't understand the word. But the main thing is, what do they say? Write whatever you want about me, but spell my name right. Good. Yeah. Something is off. Good. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe said as follows. Moshe knew that the Yisoyed HaYisoydus of Torah is bittal to the Rabbi Neshalayim. Surrender to truth. MS. Moshe looked at Rabbi Akiva and he saw the dazzling brilliance the charisma, the courage, the creativity. 
But Moshe, had to, <laughs> Moshe couldn't learn. Everybody in the base Medrash understood besides Moshe. Rekiva set up beside Reb Chaim, or a Griz, or a Shmuel, or a Benachim, or a Kiva Egez. Everybody understood. Moshe couldn't understand. Sorry, I don't get this. Well, it means Moshe was disturbed by something. He knew that Rabbi Akiva is sharing Torah, but he didn't see that complete humility and loyalty and alignment with the Yisoyed HaYisoydus of Torah, which is, I'm here to serve God, not me. And this touched him and disturbed him deeply. And then Rabbi Akiva built some extraordinary, magnificent foundation. And somebody said, Rebbe, what's the premise for that paradigm? Rabbi Akiva said, Halacha l'mashim is Sinai. Now I have to quote Labav Shereb in Yiddish. He said, Moshe does gehert to do that. Ah! Rabbi Akiva hot a Rebbe! Nesiyash v'daytoy. E hot a Rebbe! When push comes to shove, at the moment of truth, of emes, he says, the yisoyed of everything, if you go deep down, it's Halacha l'mashim is Sinai. Nesiyash v'daytoy. Moshe says, this is emes, this is Teres emes. And for me, it's what it's all about. I think every person needs to soar, spread your wings, and change the world in your own way, because every person has a contribution that nobody else could make. And when we crush that creativity, I don't think it's fair, and I, don't th- and I think it's also a betrayal of our shlichus, because if Hashem gave a person talents, this is your light that you have to share with the world. It's not just we're not letting them be successful. I think we're depriving the future from their lichtekeit, from their oil. But, and this is a profound but, we, each and every one of us needs to know that when somebody comes to me and says, what is this all about? Who's ultimately at the core of all of your teachings and all of your strategies? If my answer could be, halacha l'mashim Sinai. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Chazak. Excellent. Very good. Uh, I'm curious about something. How, Bob Trapp is your Rebbe. You're grounded and you're basing yourself on what you heard from the Rebbe, and, and clearly you, you have a right. You spent enough time immersed in his teachings to actually be able to claim that you know what the Rebbe held. But the Rebbe's not here anymore, and a person needs a, a moral compass. They need someone to sit with, A for inspiration, you know, you're giving inspiration a whole day. You also need to go get inspiration. And Paul, you also have questions. So we're, we're, who, who's your Rebbe? How do you... How do you know? that's, a, that's a great question. So there are people I constantly talk to or consult to, previous Rebbe's, Rosh Hashivas, friends, colleagues, mentors, people that I respect. And the truth is different topics. I have to speak to different people and get their advice, get their feedback. And this is very important, you know, a person who needs mentors and needs friends and so forth. Um, but I do say that I still spend a lot of time learning the Torah of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, listening also to his shirim. They remain for me a very, very powerful reservoir of inspiration, empowerment, invigoration, and perspective in, in turbulent times. Um, in terms of my own inspiration, this is... Uh, this is a personal avayda that I have to work on every single day. If, you know, a Hatzala, a, Hatzala va- a Hatzala ambulance is taking somebody to the hospital. As I once told a Hatzala guy, I told him, you got to learn a little bit every day. He says, I don't have no time. I'm saving people's lives. And I said, you know, there was a guy in Hatzala and he was taking somebody to the hospital. And then the passenger said, there's no gas. He says, we don't have time to fill up with gas. We have to get to the hospital. If I'm not filled up with gas, I have nothing to give. So this is so true about every teacher, every communicator. People feel it. They, sometimes you hear a speaker. I was once in a speech, and when the speaker spoke, not only was everybody sleeping, he himself, it looked like that he himself fell asleep. He was bored of his own teachings. You know, when you're not inspired, when you're not stimulating yourself, when you're not challenging yourself with new ideas, and you get bored of yourself, somebody once said, I think I'm bored and it's with me. So I think this is a a, a critical component, and it's true for everybody, for every Rebbe, Rosh Hashiva, parent, uh, Mashgiach, Menahel, Rav, Rebetzin. I I don't know if you've you've made the decision, or if you're the, but you're associated, let's say, I don't know if a movement is the word, but there's a certain uh, 
shift that has crept into Kal Yisrael over the last few years, and a lot of the people who pass through some of the places you're associated with, we'll say it like that, um, are part of this change. It's what maybe in the yeshivas they call sort of a kumzitz culture. That means we can't talk a lot about Averis, we can't talk a lot about, about Gehenim. That way didn't work. Too many people are broken, so many people are scared. So we're going to focus a lot on how much Rabbi Hashem loves every year and what it means when he put on tefillin, and we're going to make it easy for you. And also there's going to be charcuterie boards on the side and a, and a hookah and a guy playing guitar. People had a very hard time with it. A lot of people certainly felt very inspired by it, and people who weren't going to things before it certainly went. So I know that's a much bigger question. I'm curious how you view the phenomenon and, and your role within it. Right. You, you, I can really ask you anything. It's a, <laughs> you really don't flinch. You're ready for anything. I don't th- Listen, I think when we're anchored in Toyota, we can address every topic. Somebody once asked me, is there anything that we're not allowed to talk about? And I told them, look, there's a Gemara in Chulun Koflamates. Haman minatayra minayin. Haman minatayra minayin? We don't talk about Haman. No. If there's something in the world, is takel bar bar There's a Torah perspective. Torah has what to say about Haman. So what, what do you say about this? Haman minatayra minayin. Does it make sense, comes as culture? Do you know what I'm talking, referring to? I, this? I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. About. And I think we have to address two, two dynamics here, and both very authentic. The, the Yisaid HaYisaid is the end of Kaihalas. Soiv Dover HaKal Nishma, Selikim Yeravas, Mitzvahis of Shmar, Kizeh Kal HaAdam. Vayitzaveinu Hashem Lasses, as Kal HaChukim Ha'elu Liyiris, Hashem Alekech, as Moshe Rabbeinu tells Kal Yisrael. The ultimate question I have to ask myself is, do I want to bring Yidin, Yiddish Akindalach closer to the Rabbi Nishalayim? Mm-hmm. Closer to Avas Atayra, Avas Hashem, Avas Yisrael? That's the question. The Noyam Elimelech, Rabbi Elimelech of Lezhensk, who was not part of the Kumzitz culture, although maybe the whole Hasidic movement was seen as a Kumzitz culture relative to the Lithuanian world, that's possible. But he writes in Parshish Kairach, he says something incredible. He says there's a Mishnah of a Metziah, Dafyud, that if I find a mitzi, I find a diamond, and I fall on it, and then somebody else comes, he chaps it, the second person acquires it. So the Gemara says, why am I not kind it with Dalat Amas? I go into the six feet range of the diamond, it's mine. So the Gemara says, because he fell on it, this person shows, I'm not interested in the Dalat Amas formula. I want to fall on it. And that's why he doesn't acquire it halachically. And if you grab it, you take it. So the Noyam Elimelech says, and I quote, you can look it up, Noyam Elimelech Kairach. Okay. And I think this is the most accurate and authentic and deep response to your question. He says, sometimes you find a neshama. It's a metziah. It's a beautiful neshama. But he says, like metziahs, you find them in unexpected places. Matsasi David Avdi says the magician is doim. Sometimes there's neshamas, he says, they go through a lot of challenges. There's a beautiful neshama there. And then he says, comes a person, and nafal Allah. A person falls on this neshama. He says, abuses the neshama, denigrates the neshama, schleps the neshama further into the abyss. Then a second person comes, he says, he's mechazek the neshama. He lifts up the neshama. He lifts up the neshama. He shows the neshama how great it is. He says, the second person, zachaboy. You'll never imagine the schus of the second person who was mechazek the neshama. Freg the Gemara, come on, that's not the way. The way is Dalad Amis. What's Dalad Amis? The Gemara says, Meis mitzvah koinah mekayme bedalad Amis. Dalad Amis is the size of a grave. Six feet. That's the size of a grave. Says the Nelch, you want to be koinah somebody? Yes, kilo yoyim amis. Tell him about Gehenim. Don't tell him God loves you and tell him how beautiful he is and what potential he is. Don't start helping him identify his traumas and show him his deep psychological potential. Tell him the MS, there's Ganeiden, there's Gehenim, there's right, there's wrong. And if you don't come back to Derech you're going to burn in purgatory. Dalet Amas, that's how you kind Says the Gemara, this is how the Rebbe of Melech explains it. Kivan de nafal alei, galadaita, de benefila lo nichelei delikna. Bedalet Amas lo nichelei delikna. Since this person is in a state of nefila. You should know that your Dalar Amas speech 
will never be him kinda. And in his words, you tell him that he's going to die one day, he doesn't care about death. He has friends who overdosed. He has friends who committed suicide. He doesn't care about death. You're telling him, be a man, be a man, make something of yourself. You're killing yourself with your drugs. I don't care. Death doesn't mean anything. To you it means something. To me it means something. To these kids, it means nothing. The cemeteries are filled with their friends. These are like Hayash Lamissa. You're not going to get him. He is so filled with pain and so filled with trauma. For him, death is relief. Don't you get it? Drugs is the way he escapes his pain. I don't have that trauma. So I don't understand it. I don't relate to it. I'm like, just be a normal person. Wake up in the morning. Be a man. Get a job. You don't have to be the God of Hadar, but just be a man. Finish yeshiva. So says the Noyam Elimelech. There's no way the Dalai Amas are going to be kind to him. Because look at him. He's such, he's so much nefila. Look at his lifestyle. The only way you can be kind to him is hechzik boy. You have to give him so much chizuk. And you have to hold on to him. And you have to remain attached to him. And that's what I feel. This is, I feel, Dvar Hashem. People who cultivate this approach save hundreds and thousands of souls from depression, from addiction, from the abyss, and sometimes from suicide. Now, are there people who utilize... <laughs> who, for whom Dalit Amas would have worked as a Kenyan, but because of this wholesale approach of Hechzikba, they're losing it on the optimal okay. Kenyan for them. So I don't see this as a wholesale approach. I just have to say this to you. I don't see it as a wholesale approach. And those who may use it as a wholesale approach, right? I think they themselves often need that chizuk and mentorship and guidance. I know a lot of these people that we're addressing, call it the kumzit style. And there's usually so much frustration and so much disillusionment. And people say, oh, just tell them the truth. Tell them to wake up and smell the coffee and grow up. Tell them to grow up. Here's the problem. We live in a generation where whether we like it or not, we can all deny it. But the trauma of 2,000 years has emerged to the fore of consciousness. Now you'll say we had Zaydis and Bavis. They weren't traumatized. Stalin was not a source of trauma. Hitler was not a source of trauma. The Russian Tsars were not a source of trauma. Khmelnytsky and Turkmenistan and Vespasian were not a source of trauma. Suddenly in 2021, with the prosperity that's unheard of, in generations with Toya Maz and Charlotte Aden Fenaitim with Pesach Resort, suddenly everybody is traumatized. No. Come on, right? Good. Great question. Excellent. So I could sit on a throne of judgment and sit in my cocoon and talk about the superficiality and the pustkite of today's generation and wax eloquently about the good old days in Grodna. And the good old days in the Altamir, the mir I'm talking about in Lithuania, and talk about Baranovich. Wait, wait, that's not fair. Let's at least bring it over to Russia, too. There was okay. also Lubavitch. Okay, Lubavitch. And there was a lot of. And Minsk, and Pinsk, and Rostov. <laughs> and Rostov, and Niezhin, and Liadi, and Liozhna, yes. Right, okay, yeah, you can go on now. You can proceed. We play fear, you know that. Yeah, don't just yeah, like, yeah, no yeah. Baranovich alone. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just did a beautiful article on a Bolchanan. The magazine. So, so. Peranovich was uh, in my head. Off topic, Davi Zafir wrote the article for us, one of our best. He wrote this article on Rabbi Khan. The feedback, it was so empowering to know that people don't just care about Trump or whatever. They want to hear about Rabbi Khan. They want to go through his map to America yes. in 1938, and they want to revisit Memphis yes. with him. Yes. It, it was, it was a, a humbling reminder to me that you don't have to talk down to people. Yeah. You can talk up to people. Sorry, yeah? And Rabbi Khan once said... <laughs> I mean, that Rebbe and his yard site was just now, Yud Gimel Tammuz. He was shot. 80th yard site. 80th yard site, 1941. And Rebbe Khanan said right before the Petir, which was in the article, that we're all carbonists and we should make sure that there's no mum in us, there's no blemish piggle. in us. Shouldn't be piggle. Those were his last words. And in, uh, brothers yeah. in America. So Rebbe Khanan once said, Vishinantam Levonech, it says in Sifri, Rashi quotes, Elo HaTalmidim. So yes, why doesn't it just say, Vishinantam LaTalmidecha? Teach your students. That's what it means anyway. It means teach your students, not only your biological children. And he says, you would have missed the point. What the Torah is trying to tell you is the only way you can teach your students 
is if you see each child, each student as a child, as a ben yachid, my children. So I don't, I don't see, I, when, we, when I am trying to bring out the goodness of somebody, I don't see it as a wholesale approach because we're living in a time when the fact is anybody who's dealing with this sugya, as they call it, this sugya of OTD, of kids in pain, of addiction, of kids not fitting into the system, knows the truth. You are dealing with so much brokenness. And I could sit back and say, eh, ridiculous. The Haksta Chinik, nobody is broken. They're manipulating all of us, all the therapists and all the coaches and all the rabbis in order to get a Kumzitz Judaism. And I say, I wish you were right. But the fact is, after 2,000 years, I think it's part, I think, my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, it's part of the Simonim of Geula. We were now given a mission to spit out from our system all of the untold layers of trauma that has been paralyzing us for a very long time. In epigenetics today they know that trauma is bequeathed through the genes, which means you can have a 13-year-old, a 16-year-old who's struggling, not because their father is dysfunctional or their mother has borderline personality, that too, or because they were molested or abused, that too. But it could be they're carrying something that comes from the Elta Zayda, from the Elta Baba, and they are forced to confront it. You are highly sensitive but, okay. people who so are let, dealing let me, with a lot. Let me ask it in a grub yes. way. You have a 55-year-old accountant in Mansi who learned in Tyre Vadas. He's a very <laughs> successful, functional, Eulicha <laughs> person. Okay. He walks in every year, and the chazan says, on the first night, his heart trembles, and he reaches for his Rabbeinu Yaina, because he really wants to do tshuva. And now somebody said to him, well, you know, why don't you come? The Rabbi Jacobson is doing a musical sichus. It's definitely because I should come. And then I go to my shul. Okay, and he couldn't find parking by a shul, and somehow we ended up. You have more parking by you. Whatever it is, he walks in, and there's 19 guitars over there, and the vibe of the room is wow. It's like a, the best perm suit in his life didn't come to this. He's never going back to hear Mertzai Manucha again, and we, we relinquished, we forfeited that tremble in his soul for something. Maybe? Great question. And you talk about the musical slichas. I think it's good to address I'm, that. I'll give you an example. That's a classic example of this. And I've gotten a lot of feedback over the years. And I just want to share that with you because I think it's important to see how things evolve. Um, uh, in my community in Muncie, I've seen Mitzayi Shabbos Slichas. Somebody once came over to me and said, you know, prepare us for Slichas. Make a fabrengen before Slichas, which was the minig by many Hasidim, actually, that before Slichas, for a few hours till one, they used to have a fabrengen where they would have divrius iris and chizuk. I actually, myself, just personally, I'm not judging anybody, the musical Slichas is not something that speaks to me. I like to have a Slichas which reminds me and is a replica of the slichas that I grew up with as a child, which happens to be by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, where there was no musical slichas. At the end they sang, Rachamana da'ani, Rachamana da'ani, which is a beautiful, beautiful, heart-stirring, old chesedr shenigin that was actually composed by the Rebbe's grandfather, the rabbi of Nikolayev in Ukraine. So we had this beautiful fabrengen for a few hours. At the end I announced, everybody now, I'm finishing 15 minutes early, a quarter to one, go to your minyanim, go back to your minyanim, and I went <laughs> to my minion, to my minion, which was a very, what you would call traditional, conservative, However, I saw that there were hundreds of people who told me, they came over to me and they said, the only reason we're coming to Slichus is because of, because of you. Can we do a musical Slichus? I said, Gesundheit, listen, you want to do Gesundheit? And therefore, every year I announce, everybody go your slichas. I do the fabreng and pre. But there are people who feel this is how they connect best to their souls and to the Rabbi Nishalayla. Now, if it's something that's outside of halacha, obviously it should never be allowed. If it's something within halacha, you know, is, does it become an obligation for clients? But I think just to delegitimize a person who may feel a much deeper connection in their own way, I don't see the value of it. And let me just say one more thing. That 55-year-old graduate of Tayyar Vadas, have an intimate conversation with him and ask him if for the last 55 years he ever felt a real love to God and to Yiddishkeit with a lot of serenity and tranquility. A lot of these 55-year-old people may tell you, 
My relationship with God is one of dread. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Elul are the worst days for me. All I wish is that they're over because I know God is building a bigger Gehenim just for me and my sins. So I just want to say that for some people, that dread and that fear turns into a torment. And it's really a Yiddish guy that is very, very restricting. Now, Elu Velu Divrel Chayim. There is a shita and there's a mahalach in Klal Yisrael that focuses very much on that kav. And for some people, it's awesome and amazing. But just realize, there's a lot of people who are suffering from a Yiddishkeit that they feel is oh, what very, about, very toxic. I, I hear. This is my final question on this topic. Okay. Um, what about the spillover message to the rest of the people? I'm not. This is not associated with you. But over the last few years, there's been a lot of purveyors of the idea of Kilo Averos really don't matter, and it's really not, not real, because you could always, if you would know what tshuva, if you know how much Hashem loves you, and if you know you fall Great down, question. get back up, it's okay. It doesn't really make a difference anyhow. So, somebody is overcome by taiva, it's a lot easier to succumb when you know that could just really, there's an easy pass. I, I can go to Uman and say, Tidin Klali. I can give money to X, Y, Z. Does anybody ready to take your money for tshuva? And if worst comes to worst, I could really do tshuva. Great it's not question. that hard. Tshuva is the easiest thing in the world. Like one here, tshuva, one moment, etc. We gave this a- a- excellent question. I would just say two points. Number one, every message, even the most glorifying and beautiful and most sacred message, can sometimes be misused. But the essential message here is not one that was neschadish in the twenty-first century. Anyone who really studies all of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov and all of his students knows that this message is repeated hundreds and thousands and thousands of times. And it's one of the fundamental yesidus of Pnimi Yisatayra. And for the, for, for, for the truth is, you won't only find it in Sifri HaBal Shem Tov, you'll find it by the Rishonim, you'll find it in Chazal, you'll find it in Sifri HaGra, you'll find it from Rechaim Velazhen. In Chassidus, it became a very powerful and accentuated idea, but it's not a Chiddush of Chassidus. Can people sometimes misuse holy, sacred ideas? Of course. But the fundamental idea is not that our various don't matter. The fundamental idea is that your relationship with the Rebbeinah Shalalam is absolute, it's non-negotiable, that at your core, that relationship is untarnished. So to the contrary, Averis is really an aberration from who you really are, and never think that just because you stumbled and failed, it really compromised or mitigates that essential purity of its Sumer Shalyai Mechaper. Now I want to ask you a question, okay? What, what do you think would create a better and healthier relationship between you and your father and your mother or your grandparents? If you knew that your father and mother told you, listen, Rabbi Yisrael, or listen, Rabbi Yankul, or listen, Dvaira, these are the laws in the house. You follow them, you have a relationship with me. You don't follow them, you're done. Unless you come back and you repent, but till you repent, our relationship is gone. There's no love there, there's no connection there. Or you know that your father's love to you and relationship to you is absolute and unconditional, even if you do the stupidest things. And one last question. When you have a person who displays to you that unconditional love, do you think a healthy person says, wow, you're going to love me anyway, I have an idea. I'm going to take a dagger and drive it into your chest because you're going to love me anyway. And if a person does say that, don't you think they need serious help? When I give a message to people that your connection with Hashem is absolute and non-negotiable, even when you make a mistake, and he's always waiting for that ultimate alignment and Torah and mitzvahs, is not what makes you a child of God. It's because you're a child of God that he gave you Torah mitzvahs. Do you think a healthy person would say, okay, let me just sin against this God. He loves me anyway. I think a person says, wow, if you are such a friend to me, I want to be close to you. I don't want to stab you in the back. And if a person doesn't say that, then they really need a Yeshua, then they really need a completely different type of treatment and help. I also want to tell you a word from the Holy Zidotrever, Reb Tzvi Hirsch of Zidotrever, who was known as the Sar Beis Azoyer. He answers a question of the Gemara, says in Rosh Hashanah, the Yud Gimel Midas Arachim, the 13 attributes of Mesh begin, Hashem, Hashem. Why twice? So the Gemara says, Kan Kaidim Shechata, Kan Lacher Shechata, before you sinned and after you sinned. So the Rosh says, Why do you need Midas Arachim and before you sinned? I understand compassion after you sinned. Why compassion before you sinned? So the Rosh says, Hashem knows you're going to sin. So he needs compassion even before. The Zidat says, <laughs> it's a real Chesedah Shavar, I have to tell you. 
before you sin, you need a different type of compassion. Compassion for your arrogance, for the feeling of holier than thou. Me? He says, before I sin, you need a different type of rachamim. The rachamim that allows you to be human and vulnerable. The rachamim that allows you to open your heart to people who are broken. Rabbi, uh, here, can I, can I respectfully disagree or ask a question? <laughs> it's not chas v'shalom, my place at this. It's a question. I'm a father of children. Baruch I think I have a nice relationship with my children. I would hope that they would want to listen to me. There's a big difference of how I would warn them not to go out of bed after bedtime. You can't have another drink to how I would warn them not to play with matches. There's a very big difference. For the first one, about not going out of bed, I would say, please don't go out of bed. And if they came out and said, Shafel, please go. I asked you so many times, you're really great. You're the greatest kid in the world. Because it doesn't really make a difference to me that much. How much they violated, it's just a question of my own convenience. If they were playing with matches, or if I was the sort of person who kept guns in the house, or anything that has the potential to really harm them and change their forever, chas v'shalom, I would probably not say, Shayflu, well, please don't play with matches. I love you anyhow. I wouldn't do that. We're dealing with, a, we're dealing with hate. Maybe severing, maybe have a crisis. Maybe things that can really impact the person's forever. Who says that, this, that just because I like my father better, that's the right way? You're playing with fire. Right. But what if it's exactly the opposite? What if my only hope to, to, to have this child, this youngster, seized from the Chayavi Christus and Mrs. Besden is when they feel wholeness because there's so much brokenness in them for whatever reason. I want to tell you a story. A boy came over to me after a lecture. I gave a shir about Shabbos. The last 20 minutes I spoke about the beauty of Shabbos. He came over to me afterwards and he says, I wish one day I'll be able to keep Shabbos. I wish. I wish one day I'll be able to relate to your words. I said, you didn't relate to my words. He looked at me. He looked, if anybody was watching, it was private. And he says, how could I, when my molester chose Friday night in shul, after everybody left, he knew that Friday night nobody stays in shul because everybody goes to have a Shabbos meal. And that was the opportune time to utilize my body to be able to satisfy his demonic impulses and instincts for three years every Friday night. He says, I cannot keep Shabbos anymore because for me the word Shabbos triggers the deepest pain. Now, I listened to this story. I watched this boy. I could tell him, do you know that in the time of Bezdin, if you would be Mechal Shabbos, and there was Edom and Asra, and I could describe to him the Mishnah, Masech to Sanhedrin, everything that they would do to him. I can do that. What do you think is going to happen? You think I'm going to get him to keep Shabbos the next Shabbos? Or he's going to look at another rabbi who's protecting the perpetrators and the abusers and doesn't even understand the depth of his trauma. And you know what I did? What the Naim Alei Malach says, the Mishnah of Metziah, Hechzik boy. I just held on to him. I held on to him. I literally embraced him. He put his head on my shoulder and he started to cry. He started to cry and cry and he said, one day I'll get there. One day I'll be able to keep Shabbos. Yes, when we are talking about a very wholesome situation where my children feel connected to me, where they have the four S's, they feel safe, secure, seen, and soothed, where there's deep attachment and deep connection, where their identity is solid and powerful. Saddam Mensch, there's a person, a person who feels their own value. Yes, you are a thousand percent right. You're not disagreeing with me because I agree with you a thousand percent. But when I am facing a person, for whatever reason, is tzabroch and avshtiker. Their heart is torn in a thousand pieces. There's no person there. There's no self-value. That's why they're numbing themselves. They're escaping their pain. They'll say, I'll do anything, but just get me out of my body. Get me out of my consciousness. My brain is too scary. And they'll do anything to numb themselves. When I'm talking to that child, I speak about Chris and Mrs. Bezden. Great, I wish! Skila Sre for Herod Chenek, which is the fastest Misa. Take me to the gallows. That's what, his, that's what his own best friend did. That's what he saw another girl do. Rabbi Jacobson, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your passion. I'm grateful for your eloquence. I want to give you kaychas. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for coming in. Thank you.